and we are being recorded. Take it away, Pete. Hi, everybody. Data Tribe Coffee Hour. It's been a minute. Uh, I'm joined by <laughs> my co coordinators Sayantani and Jen. And today's guest, Tim from the product team, is going to tell us all about uh, new updates in the Spring 21 release for Data Prep 3.0. Uh, I do like to say that this is kind of the MTV unplugged of uh, virtual events. So, you know, feel free to, to hop off mute, ask questions if you got them. And uh, if there's bandwidth at the end and you just have general questions about stuff you're building that's all broke, feel free to ask. We're here. Tim, mm -hmm. it's all you. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Nice um, to be here. My name is Tim Bizalt. I'm a product manager for the Tableau CRM data platform. And I'm here to talk about anything really that you are here for to, to learn about. Um, I thought I'll share an update about our spring release that is currently in sandboxes and we're starting to roll out to production soon. So I'm prepared to show you what's new in specifically the data platform. But obviously I've been with the analytics product for six years now, um, and I might be able to also answer questions in other areas if you have any of those burning ones. But Pete, you're pretty good at hosting um, a good selection right, of, of my colleagues that will address um, some of those specific areas as well. Um, Pete, how do you usually kick it off? Should I just jump right in or should we collect a couple of early questions to kind of see where we're trending in terms of the content? Well, I think I know every name on the bridge right now, assuming that I'm guessing last names correctly. Uh, I would assume that everybody here is uh, at least familiar with data flows at a minimum. I know at least one or two people who have never seen current state data prep. Uh, but mm -hmm. there, are, there are no amateurs on, yep, I am guessing last names correctly. Uh, so <laughs> assume you've got a, a, a pretty tech savvy audience and just, you know, show us whatever you want. But I mean, yeah, if anybody's okay. got, if anybody's this got- This is all you, Tim. This is all you. <laughs> Perfect. Then why don't I just jump in? And make sure that you know you can always ask questions at any point in time. Just interrupt me. I think that's what that's what I'm here for. This session is for you, and uh, I can handle questions. Hopefully, in just go on on off mute if you're unable to do that. Maybe use the chat function. There's a chat function here, right? Yeah, we have Perfect. a chat function. Cool. So let's, yeah, feel free to, to fire away. And just a few slides to kick things off. I wanted to show you a demo of data prep. But before we jump into that, um, walk you through of what's new from a, from, from a feature function perspective in data, in data platform. And as usual, I'm going to make a couple forward looking statements. So please be aware that um, some of those may or may not arrive in our product. I will try to qualify what's in the spring release and what is further out, which would, you know, I think spring release is pretty much done deal, but anything beyond that would be a forward looking statement. So make sure you're making, you're purchasing decisions based on the software that's available today. Just real quick on the name change, you're probably aware Tableau CRM, it's pretty exciting to be part of a large analytics family in Salesforce with the combined analytics competency of, of Tableau and Einstein analytics. And now we are part of the Tableau family with a rebranding to Tableau CRM. But uh, Sayantani and I were just talking, nothing really has changed from our commitment to our customers and also from our internal structures. You know, we are um prioritizing features that make the cross integration easier but uh, we're going to market as the best analytics for salesforce so whenever you have whenever you have a user 
as part of the Salesforce ecosystem, as part of the Salesforce platform, that's when Tableau CRM, aka Einstein Analytics, is the right fit for you. And in terms of the Tableau, since we're on the topic, in terms of the um, Tableau integration, we have three major themes that I wanted to walk you through. Maybe let's jump right into connected. Um, the theme is no dead ends. Essentially, if you have Tableau online, you can now bring your Salesforce data through Tableau CRM data prep into your Tableau hyper output environment. So basically, we're creating Tableau hyper files using our new output connector that's in beta for the spring release so that you can share that data um, from Salesforce into Tableau online. And with Tableau data prep, you, um, Tableau CRM data prep, you can combine and blend and shape your data and prepare your data and make sure it's ready for analysis. And that's just one step towards better integration that if you happen to, to own the variety of products that you can seamlessly share data and then in the future also seamlessly author data and collaborate <laughs> together. You may have noticed that uh, Salesforce has intent to, to acquire Slack. So that's another possible exciting integration opportunity coming up in the future where, um, you know, the cross collaboration between analytical environments and between your teams is just going to be easier through, uh, through integrating um, through Slack. Any questions so far on, so I'll, maybe I'll just keep going on, on this um, spring high, high, high level themes. Um, when it comes to the output connectors, I think it's a really exciting area. We have for the first time the ability to not just create data sets and create stories off of these data sets and Einstein discovery or create dashboards and lenses off of these data sets and embed them back into Salesforce. But now the data platform is essentially a truly true data platform with the ability to take data from anywhere from our external data connectors, from our Nina Salesforce connectivity, apply some of the cool machine learning functions I'd like to show you today as well in data prep, like sentiment detection and other predictions, and then stick them into a Snowflake environment, put them into AWS S3, put them to Tableau, or even now with that Salesforce output connector beta, move them back to a Salesforce custom object or a, um, you know, a set of five Salesforce standard objects where we support insert and or upsert um, operations into the Salesforce object model from data prep. So it's kind of the round trip and all of our Einstein Analytics Plus and um, growth customers, um, those the licenses are still called EA, um, now have that really powerful compute engine when you think about it, you know, with uh, the ability to use the Salesforce connector, transform the data, and then move it back to Salesforce. Oh, so I'm, I'm curious actually to, to learn from you on, on what ideas you have around that. Tim, two quick questions. Uh, what you're showing as beta is in spring 21? Yes, that's all spring. Yes, so that's um, new as of spring. So we have to, all we have to do is turn on the, the usual analytics settings and turn on the betas. For Tableau hyper output, it is a um, admin setting in setup okay. or um, for, um, in, your, in your analytics um, setup screen. For Salesforce output connector, it is, my understanding is a, um, a so, more of a pilot where I believe currently it's PM controls. So that one is you need to reach out to um, your Salesforce account executive to get enabled into the Salesforce output connector. Okay, and who's the PM for that? Chris? Chris Ames. Okay, I can reach out to him. Uh, the other thing is talking about connectors. Chris Ames uh, gave an excellent presentation today about connectors in the, on the London Data Tribe. And you can find the video on the YouTube channel for Einstein Analytics. It was a awesome shout out. Thank you. Yeah. 
So you don't have to cover that part, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's been a while that I was at Connect SPM. <laughs> On the kind of moving right to left, I guess, this time, um, on the scale side, we have an exciting additional beta coming for um, SQL support for Tableau CRM. And I think of this as yet another integration story with um, Tableau. You know, at the, the lingua franca for analysts and for Tableau, obviously, is SQL. We have a big push toward uh, syntax support for SQL, not just on our query engine, but also on our data platform. So the data prep formula node, you may have already noticed, uses the SQL syntax. And um, that's kind of the, in our mind, you know, the standard um, transformation query language for the future. Whoops. Okay. Just a little bit about background now. I was not sure if everyone else is it. Okay. Um, and then we have a, we've, we've been focusing on continuing to improve the sharing inheritance capabilities. If you're not familiar with that, it basically takes the Salesforce operational security model <coughs> and propagates it to your Einstein analytics Tableau CRM data set. So you can just enable this feature um, check a checkbox and define which source ob Salesforce source object sharing rules you would like to apply to that data set, and we apply it for you essentially. So it's a bit of an easy button for setting up security so that you don't have to set up a security predicate manually. Um, the cool thing is you can also mix and match if you need to. So there are certain limits if you have an extremely complex sharing implementation on your Salesforce core side with thousands of rules per object or um, per, per row, that's when we are, you know, starting to hit a couple of thresholds. But our analysis shows yeah. that... <laughs> Can we have it today? Go ahead. <laughs> yes, that is, so sharing inheritance is available today. And um, if you go to... If you go to your um, Tableau CRM setup here in this org, let me um, do this maybe on the side right here, is um, you just enable it and it's, it's relatively risk-free to, um, to enable it in your org because you still need to opt in every specific data flow or recipe that is using it. So nothing will change when you enable that perm, um, except that you may see, when you're looking at the data flow monitor, you may see some additional um, uh, nodes going in there saying, dropping sharing rules for um, node XYZ if, if we're not using them. Um, but really there's no impact to the security model to just by just enabling it. Um, it, you need to explicitly actually enable sharing inheritance for, um, for each object in when you have data sync turned on, and then it's kind of propagating it through our, um, through our stack. Apologies, um, it's a little slow, but essentially you, you go to settings, you turn it on, and then we have the sharing inheritance coverage assessment which basically determines automatically in your org which objects are covered or not covered. I saw we had uh, two questions come in. Um, Jen, are you looking at them? And would you mind? Because I don't think I can see them and share my screen at the same time. I just see the welcome this meeting's being recorded. I don't see uh, okay. the other questions. Um, awesome. I had a couple questions. So I, my experience with sharing inheritance is you click the button and it's either going to work or it's not because you're, um, you're capped at it. My understanding is that it is kind of hijacking the global search API so that that search bar at the top to try and understand, you know, what records the user can and can't see. And if they can see more than 300 records, 
And there's other factors, like if they're granted visibility of rows through more than 400 sharing rules, group memberships, um, then it'll fail, and then it falls back on the security predicate. So even for users that aren't covered, it's not an issue. And the inheritance yeah. assessment is actually really groovy because it'll tell you which users are not covered. And a lot of times it's gonna be like a system admin or some top level data steward, and maybe it's just a non-issue anyway. But um, I know at one point, uh, there was a pilot to push that to 5,000 rows. Is, yes, Knox, is, is the cap still 3,000? And um, what's the roadmap on that? Because a lot of times, you know, and it's never best practice, but if I get brought in for an analytics project, I can tell people that their org is broke as much as I want, but I have to work with what's available. And you'll have groups that contain roles and their subordinates that are then members of other groups. And, and the, the group, public group structure is absurdly flexible with good reason, but it allows for complete, <coughs> just throw best practice to the curb and just a nightmare model where you know just you share uh you create a sharing rule with one group and they they do the dumbest things it's like when account name not equal to game of thrones share with this group and now suddenly you're not going to be able to get anything because everybody on the sun has like six memberships in that group because just yeah. people aren't maintaining right. it well so so the uh, original role the original role limit does not exist anymore actually p that we had so the the first iteration of sharing inheritance was very limited to like five thousand which was almost nothing um now the new rules are descriptors per record and descriptors per user so these are basically depending on how many sharing rules you have that would apply to a specific record or that to apply to a specific um, user so if i go in and then you know I do. Uh, I select an object, and then you can basically check the coverage um, for if there are any uncovered users for this specific object. So this is what this uh, little tool allows you to do: is just making sure that you're in the clear that the coverage is 100% based on the rules that are currently defined um, and the data that's currently in the system. So, so I would argue, what, what, how do we define descriptors? So a descriptor is a rule, essentially. So if you go to your um, sharing rules, a single rule counts as one descriptor. Okay. And if you, have, if you have like groups of people, um, then that is, if you, you know, you may have one rule per group, and so that's, you know, a very basic setup and then then you still have 399 rules you know that you can add to be within the limit uh, then, so tim just to clarify so if you are using public groups and then creating sharing rules out of them say there are 50 people in one public group in that case case it's not 50 sharing uh, descriptors it's still one descriptor it's just a single rule yeah one descriptor okay got it now uh so then um so, yeah my cat's had butting me um so uh will it tell you like is there a way to determine if you're over the limit you know where it, it's coming from oh uh and also do things like um manual sharing and uh opportunity team members uh do those sort of things play a factor Um, yes, I think if you have, if you have, um, rules that may apply to individual users, those would, would also count as, as a descriptor. As a descriptor for the user. So for example, for if, the user. I, if I gain access to 400 opportunities through team membership, that would be on my that would count toward my 3000 per user for that user correct okay exactly yeah, yeah i've yeah. done i've done some jerk things by inserting records into share tables to um manipulate sharing um so i'm just curious <laughs> of like how it how it how it fits in the back end correct yeah so that's where my qualifier came from you know it always depends on your on your you know operational 
operational security architecture and some rules are very elegant and apply you know with very simple logic um, but then yeah if we're doing like manually overwrites that would obviously increase the complexity so is it is it actually just like looking at the share table of the object so you could almost yeah. say like uh query the share table group by user count of rows 3000 that's your cap group by record count of rows 400 that's your cap or something Pretty much. Yeah. yeah 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 it's looking at the share table and then assess, um deriving that assessment okay that's just right. a bit and go ahead uh this still have can I just say a bit, uh, I just implement this inheritance in my Lepers dashboard. I think I speak with someone, whether it's you or someone, that we hit the 3,000 descriptors and we raised the, the ticket with the support. We got 5,000 so far and it, it works well in, in my Lepers dashboard. We have like 3,500 users in my company. So now this is, works well for us. Thanks. Thank you, and yeah, I remember um, being in touch with you on that um, and kind of discussing your, your implementation. So did we increase the limit for you? Yeah, we have uh, 5,000 now. Okay, 5,000. How's your, how's your data flow performance? It's okay. I mean, we are not, we are not on, uh, turned on sync. We are still pull the data from Salesforce directly using that data flow. It doesn't impact anything. Okay, so that's the only that's the only um drawback essentially that we are moving these descriptors along with the data, and you can think of it as yet another multi-value field that is a system field. So it's in the backend implementation is actually fairly similar to what you would do manually with the security predicate, but it is all handled by the application. Yeah, I it's just want much more easier. Yeah, I once considered actually creating a data set based off of um, share, uh, the share table and seeing if I could somehow like get beyond security limitations with it. And then I just thought, nah, we'll work with what we've got. It, because in that instance, we decided to flip the switch on sharing inheritance and see if it got the job done, and it did. And then we never talked about it again. Awesome, that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> flip the switch and move, walk away and never think about it anymore. And obviously when you do a change to the sharing model, you need to rerun your data flow for the changes to effect, take effect. So there is a little bit of a gap. Replication as well or just data flows? Yeah, well, replication as well. Yeah, actually a full sync in that, in that respect. I believe, yeah. I don't think we detect that and do an automatic full sync. Um, so there's the, the periodic full sync as well for you. You know, that could be a good option that runs a full sync Friday night. Um, yeah, so that is really just a minor feature, um, but it turned out, you know, to be obviously a good discussion topic on, on our improvements there, um, where you can see the specific users that are not covered and then some, you know, and the limits that you're, how you're trending against the specific limits, um, these two, you know, against record and the user. Um, finally, left-hand side. Uh, we... One more question. Sure. Uh, what's the difference between like and matches? Oh, uh, I, I, can, I can answer that. Um, the like operator is uh, you put the percent sign at the beginning of the string, Correct. but, if, but uh -huh. if you only put it on one end or the other, you have the equivalent of starts with and ends Correct. with. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's more flexible than just matches. Okay, great. Thanks, Pete. I did not know that. So is this new? I think that's the that's the answer. Uh, you know, asterisk. I'm not a million percent sure, but because I don't I don't so cool very much. But I, I'm under the impression that the the wild character card. It's the same thing that is there in SoQL. Yeah, the wild card of, of the percent sign in, in SoQL applies to it positionally. So you could even do something like um, if I need something that starts, I don't know if this works, but if you have something that starts with something, then the middle might be different, then the end might be the same. Maybe you jam the wild card character in the middle. I don't actually know if that would work, 
but I'm pretty sure if you wrap it, if you have the, the, the percent sign on both ends of it, that's equivalent to matches or matches container. good. Yeah. But if it's only at the start, it ends with, and if it's only at the beginning, it starts with. So basically starts with, end with, matches, everything can combine itself into like. Yeah, I think. That works. Yeah, we just used it uh, last week for uh, something that was in between like product numbers and it was, um, we ended up using matches, not like. Especially if it's got, it has dashes or any kind of symbols like random symbols in between it, you, you can't, uh, it's too hard to use like. Also, I believe matches has a limitation that you can only, you have to pass in a minimum of two characters mm -hmm. for, for matching. And I don't know if that limitation is uh, applies to like as well. There it is. That's exactly what it is, Pete. Percentages. Which is going to confuse the hack out of me yeah. because that's also the modulus function, the <laughs> modulus operator. <laughs> yeah. That's overloaded. Yeah. That's true, but it's part, part of, a, of, of that string, I guess. And modulus isn't, is it? Oh, and you can use it in you can use it in a pre-projection filter as well because I don't believe you can use matches in a pre-projection filter. You can't. Yeah, you can't use null checks either. No. Nope. So you have to you have to group, project, and regroup. And mm -hmm. if you're looking for nulls, you have to project before the grouping and coalesce. Then, and it just it, you end up with the laggiest queries ever. I'm gonna have fun with this one. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Sure. And then for the data prep side, I think I'll just show you a demo. Um, we've got an exciting, yet another exciting pilot that Jim Pan is responsible for. He built three cool new ML capabilities to bring the exact same time series time series forecasting function that we have in Zocco to data prep. So we're also using the same Holt Winters algorithm that um, the query engine is using to make these projections, except now you can combine it with data prep transformations and you can pre-calculate it and then use those, those data points as well for, your, for other operations as part of data prep. So it's yet another point of flexibility where you have the choice to either do it in real time on the query side or you can do it as part of your batch processing. And we've been working on clustering and I personally think it's pretty exciting because you know it's fantastic for white space analysis, um, customer segmentation use cases. And as part of clustering, we, we also realized, you know, we definitely need to get pivoting done. Um, so fortunately, Jim and his team just put their heads down and added pivoting to this pilot in the spring release as well. So that is part of the aggregation node where you can not just group by um, columns, you can also group by rows, similar to what you have in Report Builder. So that is Kind of exciting in itself even without clustering who so, came up with that idea <laughs> now Jim Pan. i know that that i believe current state one this is a beta right like you you have to opt in to get pivot but um yes current state or you have to, yeah see so with current state you have to within the data prep engine you have to specify these are my field values so like if you were doing it by uh, opportunity stage, for example, uh, you would have to call out these are the different stages that apply that in a subsequent release, any values that you do not call out will be bucketed as other. Do you know if it's on the roadmap that eventually it'll just detect all values that are there and create all the buckets for you? Yeah, so um, that is 
that is partially also a question, you know, towards where we're heading with um, with data prep. And maybe at this point, I can I can just jump over into a recipe, and not just talk about the pivot capabilities and in in the aggregate node and clustering, but also how we're evolving into a more complete and and powerful editing capability. So I have a recipe here that I that I built. It takes data from Salesforce in this in these input nodes. So you can see how all of these teal colored nodes are, are input nodes. One thing you you notice is that while the data preview in some cases you know takes a couple seconds to load, we are trying to make the editor interactive for the user so that the user can inspect the details and and inspect the columns as we're fetching the preview. So we're trying to make that an asynchronous process and and then you know continue to improve our performance to actually load that sample. As you were saying, um, Pete, we have currently a subset of of um, of these uh, preview. Uh, sorry, that the preview is a subset of it. And even at this point, we have a limitation where the the profile is just on a two thousand row sample. So that's also something we're working on to give you the full picture of the of the data and that is not just in the preview it's also for bucketing as you're saying you know for bucketing you really want to have a complete um, view of all of the values to take full advantage of of the preview capabilities and the sample so that you don't have to guess um, so that's that's still work in progress but you, in in the bucketing function there's one item that i realized isn't very obvious is you you know if you go in by by company and we start to to bucket these fields or maybe by country it's a little easier so i want to i want to create a new bucket and let's say europe and then i'll go in and, and select you know fields that um, that apply to my um Basically, I guess I mean as a radiator. But um, if I I can I can also type in um, values here. So if I don't have that value as part of the sample, I can actually type it in um, as well and add it manually in this way. There's a couple other places we need that, but they're all in the dashboard layer, so no one's going to hold you accountable for it. <laughs> <laughs> Except I wish I would have seen that about two weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> that's but, really handy. Now, I'm, I'm just going to assume, does it deduplicate the list so that you can't add something to multiple buckets, or can you create a multi-value field that would add things to multiple buckets for, um, you know, for example, some reps, uh, some territories will be shared between multiple teams? Um, you can only map one value to one bucket. Okay. That, that's fair, just, you know, trying to put my, because part of what I've seen is like, when you when you bucket things out with case statements, especially when you're looking at properties that are across multiple fields, like for records that are, you know, this way, this way, this way, and type equals A, do this, you could have a record that could potentially fall into multiple, multiple buckets. With the way the case statements right. work, it will always fall into the first bucket that it met the criteria for. So you have to be careful of the order that you structure them in. But honestly, this is more true bucketing akin to what's in standard yeah. reporting. So if you have that complex use case, you can still just use a regular um, calculated field for that. Exactly. So you, we have the true bucketing, but we also have case statements. So you can also go in and, and add a custom formula um, as a case statement and interact or build, you know, build a new output column here through that case statement. 
I love that it has type ahead and insert functionality on formulas and fields. And like, if you told me all I was getting out of this versus data flows was syntax validation before the data flow runs, that would have been enough. <laughs> Tim, how many, how has, many years of my life lost exactly, to missing commas? Exactly. How many times we have said the same thing? Can we just have a test the queries before we run our three hour or 12 hour long data flows, please? Uh, Tim, having said that, one point, and uh, not to derail the awesome things you're showing, but I used the case statement and uh, I had an issue where my final output type would be a text, but within mm -hmm. that, I was trying to compare numbers. So I was trying to figure out the number of days and then do, is it greater than or equal to whatever the, num uh, no, the day is in this year? And both of them are numbers, right? But the out final output was a text and it just wouldn't compare. So I had to create two separate columns for those numbers, then compare them, them using a case statement to yield the last. Uh, could, was it exclusively numerical? Could you have output it to a numeric field? No, or did you also have some text. alphanumeric? No, it wasn't alphanumeric. It, it was, was all numeric? It, no, so it was basically case uh, date of whatever the year was, the day of the year, is less than yeah. equal to uh, the current day of the year. So day of the year now, then it's year to date, else it's not year to date. And the, uh, okay. Um, you're saying have the you input seen... data types were different than the output data types. Correct. Hmm. I mean, so I did that same kind you... of case statement in the data flow, like, I mean, it was fiscal year to date, but yeah. So we have a we have a date here called converted date created date last modified converted is relatively empty. Let's use created date. You know, let's calculate the age. Mm -hmm. um, similar to your um, so we have a simple date difference function as well um, that is creating a new column mm. um, basically from the created date to mm. now. Mm when the data flow runs and then calculate it in, in months, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is, this is create, this is age sort of, right? Um, whatever this is. Oh, this is nice. Age of what are we looking at? Contact? You are literally telling us we don't have to do our epochs 10 times to get this answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so for the- Are you basis, saying that you um, don't love epochs, Santani? Sorry, what? I mean, I You're do. Saying well, you I don't love all... epochs? I mean, Peter does, but Peter's Peter. I heard a rumor that this actually <laughs> knows what a date time field is as distinct from a date field and that it knows about things that are not strings and integers. Awesome. <laughs> like I was talking with Bobby even, and he was talking about how when they're building the, the output predicted models to uh, Tableau proper, Tableau, they don't have a Boolean field oh. called a true false field. And that the strings that were being sent maximize true false because uh, discovery uses faux booleans. It's just hmm. a it's a text field with a cardinality of two. That a lot of, it, apparently it caused more issues than you would think because it's not true boolean. And that's can you show fault. it? Can you show us that again, please? <laughs> just Tim, run over that again. We're never going yeah, to get to that's it. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, can you can you show us that question. again? I agree. Yeah, please please show us again. I'd like to, I wasn't because I was. I was Mark, so this over, is cool. We tricked I was you. So, over, so overtaken with excitement, I didn't actually watch the details. Because while I'm while so, I'm seeing the the label says transform, and I saw that you did a you did some comparisons in there. Now all of a sudden, my brain is like, wait a second, you're actually transforming and comparing data inside well, no. of the data <laughs> prep. And I'm like, okay, that's that's an ETL tool. What the heck did I just see? And it's showing the preview live. You don't have to wait for it to break on you. Exactly. You yeah, know you don't have to run the, uh, the data flow for half an hour and then it, it comes back and says, it's broken. And here's a wonderfully cryptic error message to tell you why. Extreme <laughs> argument not supported outside of group protection. I love so, your app. Oh, I love those. <laughs> 
<laughs> and every, everyone else, everyone else here is saying yes. That is what uh, this does. It's a, it's a transformation tool. Uh, no duh. I'm like, well, I, I just figured that out right now. Why is that? <laughs> Us now, welcome. <laughs> Uh, Mark, remember when we used to get those cryptic messages where uh, in the dashboards that the uh, widget failed because it didn't find something called S? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've just got a quick one, and, and this is not meant to be negative, Tim, uh, but um, it, recently in using the, the new tool, um, I, I would make a change and all of a sudden, <laughs> Wow, 50 million red bars will come across the top. And I was, yeah. the, the error made no sense at all. I was chatting to Bobby and he said, um, obviously it's on the roadmap to give you know, more informative error messages. Um, is that a top priority? Because I know it's really helpful for those yeah. of us. I don't do a lot, unfortunately, don't, don't do a lot of building anymore, but we've, you know, our team and obviously people are training up new team members. They yeah. get frustrated, they have no idea what they've done wrong. Is that a priority? Yeah, absolutely, um, Mark. That's a huge priority for us. Um, we are we are adding in more better validation. We're adding in. We have already added more meaningful errors. In fact, just today, I I somehow add, had a corrupted recipe. I'm not sure if I can find it because I it was so easy to fix. And this is the spring release. I, I agree with you. Um, last release was was problematic to say the least. You know, in in, in certain cases. Oh, here we go. Um, so where we have a red bar, it's a nondescript error, unfortunately, in this case. Um, that's, yeah, two thousand. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what I typically do is, you know, I check on the source data. Is the source data, how's the source data doing? Um, in this case, it seems to be um, absolutely identical source data, but this um, join seems to be um, problematic. So if I account ID, if I join on account ID, I'm not sure if that, and then we're, we're doing a lookup on these two opportunity fields you're also creating multi-values, which is possibly problematic. So basically what we're trying to do in this case, you know, updating the, the join keys, it's a trick. Um, so what you're seeing is a little bit what we, the enthusiasm that was there earlier on, you know, I don't need to run the data flow for two hours to see at an error message. The, that experience is a little bit more immediate right now. And obviously we still have an, we still have some work to do in providing more meaningful errors and instead of just generic 2000 errors. Um, so we, we have been, we continue to really focus on it and we have the instrumentation in place in the back end to look at the most frequent errors um, that users are experiencing on our, in our next generation data prep tool. Um, I am happy to report that the success rate of serving this preview went from 97 to 99% in the last two months. So we've made huge progress on that. Um, and in some cases, you still see an error, but it's a meaningful error. You know, that 1% of failures was that 2%, um, that 2000 errors that we just saw. So we've, um, we obviously have more work to do to push that to the 99.9 so um, and adding, Sorry. Yeah, that's where we're heading. Now, I guess it's kind of like the error that I used to get a lot with ED, with discovery, where the histogram wouldn't load. You know, you're in there doing, you picking your features and the histogram doesn't load, which is just unbelievably annoying when you're working on it. That doesn't happen anywhere near as often as it used to, like way, way less often. So I'm guessing hopefully this will reach that point with the preview load. Um, I don't know if you guys have the expression in America, what you gain on the swings, you lose on the roundabouts. Um, <laughs> but in other words, you know, there's yep. a give and take, right? Like it's incredibly awesome that we've got a live preview, as you said, Pete, of the, um, you know, the calculation results and um, 
you know, all of that, not having to run it, come back in 40 minutes and it's broken and you don't know why. Um, so I think compared to that, this, you know, this is irritating, but it's definitely, definitely better. Um, and I think for me, coming from a, a no code background, um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I think it's a much more intuitive tool. We've got a new member on our team who she's very smart, but she's picking it up really quickly. And I think this will help just the more, you know, the more, the better user experience really. Yeah, there's a couple of operations you need to be mindful of that are still a little dangerous and and okay. we need to put in better guardrails. So what you just saw here with the append node, so this is basically appending leads from Salesforce. So I have my Salesforce leads here and I have a lead data set that is hanging around somewhere in my org. And I want to append it basically vertically stack the data on top of each other. And in data flow, it was, I would have to say, a pretty bad experience because you you could only map exactly matching API names, which is kind of a pain. Here, you can loosely, you have that mapping table for my data set that's coming in. And this is my left, sort of left-hand side, but really top side of the append. And then I'm bringing my data set data. And some fields do not have a corresponding field from the data set. So I'm, we're going to fill those up with nulls. You may see those in the, in the sample here as well, if, there's, if, the, if we're filling in these nulls. Um, but what's new in the spring release, I can also bring in fields that are on the data set side, but not on my leads from the left hand side. So it's a complete disjoint append, essentially, what we have in data flows as well. But the advantage over data flows is obviously that you can, they can freely map your columns, yeah, even though so they may not. So now, we, the so now we, if we have two data sets, uh, say one coming using one of the connectors and one from Salesforce and the API names need not be exactly the same, right? Correct. Awesome. Yeah. What, I've, what, I've, what I've had issues with in the past was, um, so you do, what you would do is on your two sources, you do a compute expression where merge with source equals false. And yep. then um, <clears throat> you'd rename all of your fields. Mm -hmm. But um, you can't, fake a manage package field because you can add double underscore the only the error message actually says you cannot have two consecutive underscores but it actually only uh it's not 100 percent accurate you can fake a double underscore c field but then the the crippling deal breaker for what i was trying to you know that is just more typing okay because you know now i've got a i've got a um it's just more work on one side or the other but what um what was particularly problematic was we needed to append uh, history data to, they had, they had a, a snapshot report that was based off of a, uh, uh, off of a standard Salesforce report. And the use case was, well, we were already using this report for traditional report snapshotting, and we have several years of history data. So we want to join that on. Bye, Mark. Um, and, and we can't because you can't... Um, that dollar sign snapshot date isn't supported. I think that would be an interesting question. Is dollar sign snapshot, like do, can you, can you uh, do an append on a, a, a trended data set from a trend, the, the button at the top of the report that lets you do reporting snapshots. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you append to that and, and use that, uh, map that snapshot date field? Because I can't, I can't access it for a life. I believe it's a system field. So, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah, it's got a dollar sign on it. Yeah, I think we cannot operate on system fields. One of these days, I'm so you could to, to solve that riddle. Yeah. One bar. Yeah, uh, looking forward for your creativity there. I mean, just put the now <laughs> put a put a now formula on the record and make sure that that's snapshotted in your report and use that instead. But that only helps yeah. if if you set it up before you start training. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, just one more, one more comment real quick. Um, I think Mark, you were mentioning, you know, sometimes you make an action and everything blows up. Um, we, we have one feature here. If you want to rename a field, let's say, you know, you don't like the API name of this, or it has, you know, certain aspects. Um, 
you can go in and, and change the API name here. Obviously, we do validate against um, valid names. Um, so that, that's in here. But, um, and if we, if we change the API name, we automatically propagate the changed API name downstream in the graph. So basically, you use this edit attributes uh, function, and then every references downstream from here will update, and then also out into your final data set. If you, um, you can, I can also go in and add new data to this recipe, just some basic um, graph layouts here. So this is selecting additional input data to be added to my um, recipe, and that's where I go into connected objects. Oh, time check. How how much longer do we have? Uh, Five fifty. Yeah, we got we got another half hour. As long as you okay, want. Cool. Well, until you you're until long? until you're like I'm <laughs> done with this. I'm going home. <laughs> as long yes, as you'll... I could go on forever. Um, so basically, I pick my data sets and I have maybe yet another lead data set that I want to bring in and append from my Einstein discovery scoring app. And so I select this data set. I have 37 fields here. Looks good. I want to actually bring in, bring in all of them. I could uh, unselect a couple here. So now where's that data set? It's somewhere at the bottom. Okay, so I can, can move it around a little bit um, and move it further up. And now I have this plus that I can drag and then basically tell data prep, okay, inject an append node after this in the graph. Um, so that's kind of how I specify where I want this data set to blend in. And we auto map a couple of those here. You know, looks good, just hit apply, move on. So that was, oh, now we can see for a brief moment, validation kicked in here, but it looks like everything is propagating through the graph here. Um, if I have a different operation, I can go in, first of all, I can edit the name and description here, but in this note, there's an edit, there's an edit button here, and it leads me to the same input selection screen, but instead of adding a new field, it actually replaces the existing data set, and that is a destructive operation. So if I change my, I actually change my schema entirely, if if I change it away from a lead schema, I have the downstream nodes expecting the lead fields to arrive. If I completely change the schema, we have a mismatch and they need to go clean up. So possibly, Mark, this is what might have happened, is that suddenly you know, we have introduced a new schema into an existing graph and then it blew up majorly. So we're trying to learn from those uh, situations and make it more clear to the user what they're actually doing when they're move, using this tool. Uh, Tim, another question, and this is, first of all, I think this is completely revamping data flows, right? I need not create data flows anymore if this is working for everything? Because correct and is compute yes. So we have all the functionality now, Sayantani. We have window functions in here. so. Um, when you go back, when we go back to this edit transformation, um, there's a multiple row formula, which was the, these window functions where the last major gap that we've had that we've now introduced in the spring release um, that we've made available. Um, other than that, all of the feature functions that you had in Dataflow are now available in data prep. Um, you can branch out. So there's this branching icon here. I can create another output node mm -hmm. and not just write to a data set. I can also write it to a CSV on my Salesforce mm -hmm. instance. I can use it in an output connection, um, put it in S3 and um, basically have multiple outputs to, to one specific um, graph. Which, uh, Where does that CSV be... end up? I think it downloads. So the, CS... the CSV sticks it into a Salesforce object in the Salesforce org. Mm -hmm. And 
you can download it using the public API. So actually there's a gentleman called um, Mohan. He mm -hmm. built a super useful tool um, that we can share a link for um, that helps you download this data using a command line tool. Yeah, tomorrow he is giving a presentation with Ricky on the uh, for the Tableau CRM learning sessions. Perfect. So, so in other words, this could solve for the use case that um, historically users users want to dump their data. I've never been in favor of it. There's use cases why they want to do it. So we could build a data set that you know this is that lens that kept bombing out when we set it to three hundred and fifty thousand rows. I could build mm -hmm. a data flow that's in, or a data prep recipe that creates that data set as a table. We dump it into this object, and then we could pull out something like um, uh, we could we we could just use uh, any CLI tool uh, to pull that and then distribute it as necessary. That's awesome. Correct. Uh, and someone's asking a question. Sorry, I have no idea what the answer. Pete, um, I feel like I haven't still answered um, Sayantani's question from earlier. That I, I kind of went down that um, function feature parity path. Um, one thing that we're still working on, Sayantani, and this is um, a forward-looking statement for the summer release, possibly only winter release, but. Um, we're working on the direct load. So currently data prep relies on data sync to be on, mm -hmm. but we're working on ways to allow data prep to directly load data from Salesforce as well, um, not just from connected objects. And, and this will also simplify the experience if I have my lead object here and I realize, oh shoot, I need another field from my Salesforce leads object that is, um, in this case, I have selected all 25. I could drop a field here. I could add a field if I hadn't already selected all of them. So basically, you will, I will also see fields that have not been synced but are available in the leads object. So the SFCC digest experience, essentially, we're adding back in as well um, in the future. So that is still a gap. Hey, Tim. But other than that, we're pretty much there. This is Jennifer. Um, on that screen you were on where you were showing the fields, um, is there anything on the roadmap? Because we have like a lot of data sets that have you know, like three and 400 fields. And when I was working with data prep in beta, or actually just like since this last release, um, it, there's no way to either say like check all or it was very cumbersome to try and find. And will you bring that back up again where you added the fields? Like, let's say, you know, you already have the object in there and you're trying to bring more fields. Yeah, so from, from connected objects, we do have a select all capability, but currently it only selects from fields that have already been added to data sync, to the connected object. Um, okay. So if, Does it show API and uh, label or both or one? Because that can be a huge so deal. Current, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. So currently, it's still just the field label. As soon as we get past this, release, I'm going to send a huge like request, <laughs> one large request into the team about like what I think would be helpful. But I know you guys got to make it to the release first. Also, actually, does handle, yeah. Does this handle removing a field better? Because current state, if you delete a field in core Salesforce that's referenced in replication, you have to recreate the field to get rid of it. Uh, and otherwise, you can't replicate that object. Yeah. Yeah, all of these um, schema prop propagation things are, are elements that are currently gnarly and we are slowly tackling. It's a bit like a, it's a, it's, this is a marathon for us <laughs> with um, making sure that the data experience on Salesforce data is as seamless and worry free as possible. Um, we need to do better in terms of removing fields um, that and, um, and not break our, our flows, for example. 
Um, so being more resilient to these schema changes, I agree. Uh, Nicola, I had a question. Nico, hey, how's it going? Nico, ask your question yourself. Hello, everyone. Sure. Oh, yeah, hey, I have a couple of high-level questions. Uh, so my first question was, um, like, moving forward, uh, if I'm creating like a net new data set, um, can you think of a scenario where I'm wanting to use a data flow over a recipe? Um, yes, so we have features available in data prep that are unavailable in data flows. Um, when I open up a join node here, for example, you get full uh, join capabilities, left, right, inner, outer. Um, mm -hmm. We also made an enhancement recently in a spring release where you can customize your API name prefix qualifier for the right hand side um, columns. Um, so that's similar as in data or identical to, to what you have in data flows. Also, in addition, we have the aggregation node. In this specific demo, we have the pilot turned on for, for pivoting as well. So I have the group columns feature um, that's a pilot. But without this pilot, you, you still get the ability to group by rows and define aggregate as part of your data flow if you wish to do so. And you know, we have sums, averages, standard deviations of the population, um, variation um, function, functions in, in here to, for you to calculate as yeah. part of the aggregate node. So that's the net new stuff. You get the preview as well, which hopefully speeds up your development. And you get um, you know, the discovery predict node, you get the output nodes. Um, and the thing is, if you have to make a choice between Am I going to data prep or recipe? Nikolai, when you're building for, for a client, then think of the user persona that will maintain this flow. Um, I would argue that it is a little bit easier um, to, to read um, and understand because, uh, especially with, with these annotations added, um, but in some cases, and it looks like the predict node is still relatively slow in, in serving that sample, um, we, are, we, we only support a certain complexity at this point where I see customers moving past the 180 node graphs in data prep recipes, and they're starting to struggle with the editor at this point. And this is also obviously, you know, rem Fixing error messages, making the tool more scalable are our top priorities. Is that because it's on um, over, like graphically, or you know, because the one we're using right now, um, we can have as many nodes in there, and it doesn't give you the blue screen of EA death, right? Like this one will. Um, so, what are wh when yeah. are you seeing the problem? Like, how many nodes in are you seeing that it's graphically challenged? <laughs> I think the current speed barrier is at almost 200 now, depending on what you're building, but I would say 200 is, is the current le level, but it's a, there's a good chance that a month from now or two or three months from now, um, we're able to double that to let's say 400. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at 800 node data flows, I believe that's where, because we're operating on a very, you know, we're, we're running that flow behind the scenes for you. Um, and an 800 node data flow will also run a really long time. So imagine running it in real time for the subset of data. Oops. Can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, somehow my, uh, my camera went away there for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. So basically that's where the preview will start to to become slow, and that is with 800 nodes, it's going to take us a while, you know, to actually be there. But I feel like for 400 nodes, we're we're going to be there in just a couple of months. And I would definitely advocate for anybody that needs a data flow that size, if it's creating more than one data set, you might want to break that up. But also in data prep, we have so many different options. You're going to have more nodes. 
Yes. I, I would argue you might have fewer because, for example, renaming columns historically took like four okay. times. I challenge you when this comes <laughs> after the release. We're going to try that out. Or, or <laughs> and I mean, just like a lot of things that I do today that take three, four, five, six, seven notes to do the trick, and then I have to do that trick multiple times. Um, those notes all go away because of functionality that we have now. Like one example is, um, I, I, it's so much easier for me to cast now as a, a field in my, in a, as a column in my data flow early on that I, I almost inevitably ending up, end up doing it because if I want to grab something like what is the current month, what is the current year, what is the current quarter, I end up writing this, this, this really fluffy big sack to do it. It's easier to just have that as a node. What we're seeing already is better performance with the now function. So that's one node that goes away from, you know, or sometimes as many as four nodes that just fling off my data, data flow. It's not there anymore. Um, and, you know, renaming right there for okay. four nodes. Yeah. So I would argue that much, many of my complex data flows could be collapsed into fewer nodes with, if they were to be rebuilt on this platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so, also, Tim? Uh, Tim, we are not able to see your screen. It just says you have started screen oh. sharing and that's about it. Okay, let me stop and start. A follow-up question quickly to my earlier question. So, like, do you recommend for us to have a like a long-term roadmap to maybe migrate um, some of our existing data flows to recipes? I mean, it seems like to me, like, um, more kind of your release enhancements are coming to the recipe side, to the data flow side. So is that maybe something that we need to start planning for with our customers like one to two years out that um, you know, we might want to move those data flows to recipes, especially if we you know, have all of the functionalities that we need in the recipes. So That's a, uh, first of all, I think all of us are wondering that, Tim, is like, yeah. when do we start? Should we start? What, you know, is this going to blow up on us? Are we good? <laughs> You're going to like the answer, I think. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we definitely recognize that you've made a big commitment to implement in data flows. And it is true that we're adding new functionality to, to recipes, to data prep, because it's also our next gen underlying engine that recipes run on. Data flow run on our legacy system, if you will. Um, is did the screen sharing kick back, kick back in? No. Uh, no, it's, no, it's still not working. Um, not sure what's happening. Apologies. Um, yep, and you're right. Okay. Okay. Good. So basically, what we are working on is an upgrade capability. So you will be able to have a button that says upgrade to data prep or um, you know open in data prep and we are taking the data flow um, nodes and the data flow stack or syntax that's contained in these compute expressions and compute relatives and it will just make a copy and open that copy in data prep and we will actually convert the SACL compute expressions to our new SQL um, query syntax. Um, Which would be a really good way to learn, to, to learn the conversion, see, see what it gets turned into. How is it going to play with like jerk parameters that are not actually supported in the UI that some guy who probably was trying to do something he shouldn't went in the back end and added, such as is multi-value is true on a computed field in a compute expression or um, the, probably the more common use case is those people who do use um, underscore comment uh, to comment notes. Will those just, mm -hmm. I would assume that they'll probably, if it just sees a parameter that it won't recognize, is it going to drop it or is it going to crash? Um, well, we will only offer the upgrade capability if we have validated this um, data flow JSON um, to be successful. So there's definitely going to be um, validations. And those for those individual rules, we might, if we can stick the comment into um, a node, we could, we could 
update the edit name and description. So we, we do have the description capabilities here. So we're, when we're doing this up conversion code, we're trying to take all of that over. And then if we can't parse any of it, we will tell you as well and call that out for you. So you can make a decision. Am I going to re-implement that manually? Am I going to rebuild the entire recipe possibly, you know, if it's not too complex? Or am I just um, aware that these things do not work right now and maybe, yeah, just add those in manually again. Different yeah, ways. and the, um, the realistic case that actually uh, I kind of think of is that I've noticed, I've observed that there are several parameters that were supported historically that are now kind of deprecated. Existing data flows won't fail, but they'll fail validation. So def the uh, default value used to also accept just the word default and you could put in like numerical characters directly into JSON and it would work but now mm -hmm. they have to be enclosed in quotes or it fails validation. So it's, it's more just like the data flow that you built four years ago that everybody loved that you haven't touched since and it hasn't broken. You know, I'm much more concerned about that versus something I built last week or sales analytics. Correct. Yes, and that, is, that will be dealt with as part of our up conversion code and we do something that we call a dark launch it has a you know pretty cool name for a straightforward concept where we look at all of the data flow json that's out there in the wild um, that's running we we take that definition and then we run it in parallel on uh, where we upgrade these to data prep recipe definitions you can actually get to this um, json here you can you can download this and look at the JSON definition. It's not as readable as data flow JSON, and it's not meant to be kind of um, as a computing or for you to write JSON necessarily, but it's maybe a bit of a poor man's change um, propagation mechanism from sandbox or to another sandbox. Or we do support packaging and um, change that with recipes, but if you prefer that, you know, we, we've added these buttons. Um, uh, Tim, and now back to while your uh, JSON is opening, uh, there's a question from Ivan. He says, hypothetical question: Would an identical data flow in recipe run faster or slower, and or use less API calling hours? Um, so, so the faster, slower thing is where we are still optimizing. So if I um, now, let me maybe delete this external, or actually it's just a Salesforce. Let me just save and run this and look at the monitor. So we have improved the runtime for recipes in general because of the new data platform that data prep runs on. It's a distributed computing environment behind the scenes um, of, of a technology called Apache Spark that basically splits my workload into multiple so I have I can process the same recipe on multiple machines in the background in parallel um, versus data flow ran sequentially on a on a single machine. So it's a it's a big jump from you know a data processing framework to a massively parallel um, enterprise scale ETL backend. But we have a little bit of overhead um, bringing the data in, which is what we're optimizing right now. So we're, we continue to improve the speed. Um, but the basic answer is it should run faster. Okay. And you, you will see that there's um, certain operations, you know, for, um, the, because it's distributed, we have actually less node level information available for you on the monitor page. But it's also something that we're putting back in, you know, better error message if something worse was to go wrong. Um, and then the other question is, which API calls? Um, that's really where data sync can help. You know, if you, first of all, um, Pablo CRM is whitelisted to the Salesforce bulk API. So you don't actually count against the bulk API limits. Um, to be more efficient on high data volumes and wide data, this is really where the incremental sync is going to come in and give you efficiency for, for data sync. And we're trying to also, that's one of those um, constant objectives for us 
where we try to constantly improve the, uh, the usability of data sync and the experience and the coordination with all of the other factors. We just I want you to be able to process a, a of a beast. 100 million rows in like 15 minutes for us. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's all got to be real time. I need to see it on the graph before the user hits save on the other side of the world. Or can't, no, no. So we have, we have 15 minutes scheduled now for, for EA plus users. Um, and so I can, I can run my recipe every 15 minutes. Um, we are trying to cut down even further. Um, and and that is definitely one of those roadmap topics, you know, where we're saying with the, our next gen data platform, we're hoping to be better prepared to continue that incremental processing, you know, currently data sync updates incrementally, but what if a recipe can update it incrementally as well? Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Uh, How are the processing times? Oh, I'm sorry, Sayantani, but I know you want to know this question. So if we ran the exact same thing in a data flow versus this, who wins? <laughs> Have you done it that yet? That's the question that you even had. For, That's exactly what you even I had. Know. For medium, so for medium and high data volumes, recipes will win. Um, for, for tiny data volumes, the data flow may actually be faster. Okay. Um, because there's a little bit of overhead um, which involved. One is the with, faster on? Which one did you say? For small, for small data volumes and um, narrow data, less complexity, a data flow will be faster. But yeah. for okay. higher data volumes and wider data, that's where um, recipes will, will play its strength on a distributed computing. Well, okay. the last thing I have more data and way too much going on in data flows. <laughs> so uh, even as- another... That's how we scale. You know, we, yeah. we have incredible <laughs> growth on You're our platform. It. We have, we, are, we still double our data volumes that we're processing year over year, every, every year. So mm -hmm. it's, we, it's just one mechanism for us to actually make that scale happen. Awesome. Uh, so Evan's next question is, would we see increased search and accelerated insight from recipes due to Spark? Oh, that's Evan, who I work with. He's wondering what's on the back end. That's ah. that true. It is, yeah, so it is pretty cool. It's very fascinating um, and, and I think pretty high tech um, because when you're, when you're opening this recipe, you're actually operating on a Spark server in the Salesforce um, data center. So all of the compute, all of the memory is, is coming from Salesforce and, and we're, and it also accelerates Salesforce's ability to innovate and add functionality quickly because we can sit on top of huge um, out of the box capabilities on these open source frameworks. So we can add in capabilities faster, but we're, we, because we're a shared service, you know, we're, we're always in control of what we're exposing from the back end to you, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So how does it do with those multi-value lookups <laughs> in here versus the data flow UI? They faster. Um, they should be, yeah. I mean, the again on large volumes, we should be able to process the data faster because it can run in parallel. Okay. So theoretically, I'll be, I'll be my yes. <laughs> but uh, there may always be exceptions to the rules. That is kind of the. Um, this is kind of the, the, the safe answer, I guess, that I'm giving you, but um, I no, might as well just say yes. And I'm just kind of just like, what's your opinion yeah. for entertainment purposes, right? I'm not gonna hold you <laughs> to the same um, But yeah, so after this release, or should we give it a while, like, or, or, cause I know things will be like, you know, worked out right after the release. But, uh, before you go to Jen's question, I know where she's going and maybe we we'll <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll give you an unbiased opinion. Yeah. This, is the, this is the release where I cut over. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to think. Is this where, because before it was kind of like, oh, this is cool, but it's not quite there yet. Where that's you get the blue screen. Existing, yeah. build, existing build, existing data sets are going to stay on, for me, they're going to stay on data flows for the time being. Probably another release or two until you have monsters that convert with no issue. And, uh, but new also, smaller projects can go on here. As well. Yeah, and it's only it's only 
what where I will still be using data flows is going to be maintenance of existing complex builds. If okay, remind me again build, though. Before you say that, I don't mean to like cut you off, but this is super important. What is the the run uh, limit on this versus the data flow UI again? Because I haven't looked since last release. So you know, if we're running a whole bunch of little ones all day long, right? Like fifteen minutes. Oh, they 60, sixty a day in data flows. Yeah. So these run against it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they count against the same limit. Because it almost gives you the idea that you can just kind of do all this on the side and then keep your big data flows running. <laughs> and then I'm realizing yes, and no, there's, there's really cool innovation that that's coming up that's um, that we're working on Sandbox. first of all we we <laughs> acknowledge that you may have to run multiple recipes so we're we're working on triggering those as one unit so you can just run those oh. as a pipeline just like a complex data flow so that they don't overlap you know you want to finish that work and then kick off that right. work automatically without a time gap so that is hopefully something that will arrive in summer. That's again one of those forward-looking ones. Is what kills you. It's not running things yeah. when you want them when they're perfect, right? It's when you're trying to yeah. figure out what you want that you can kill twenty your data flows in an hour if you're not careful. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, exactly. uh, question I'm before. <laughs> The question that I had was uh, regarding aggregates. So can we create a, a recipe or a data prep node, create an aggregate, and then add it back to the node? So say I have 100 million, yes. rows. I aggregate it to say 10 million, can I back it to the, add it back to the same 100 million? Yes, yeah, you can join it back. Oh. So it's just oh, two um, that is through the, um, basically, a, a bit of what we've done down here is, um, so I can, let me maybe just remove that for now, delete this output node, and then take this, what we aggregated, and then, for example, join it back in here. Ah, nice. So I can, I can bring it back. Obviously, I need to pick the right. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Fields that's here and stuff, but that's, that's supported. Um, actually, one thing that we are working on for the summer release is I currently had to basically take this output. Mm -hmm. I, I also want this um, this um, branch branch option to be draggable. So that's mm -hmm. a limitation where currently of the graph design that you can't drag that branch. Mm -hmm. You you can drag the plus. So, right. But that's coming. Awesome, that's really cool. So right now I have a few recipes that run just for aggregation and then they join to back to the data flow. And by the time it happens, it takes from the data flow and creates a recipe, joins back to the data flow, but which means my data is never current, right? And I want to stop that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's definitely a pattern that we're seeing quite often with customers. Yeah, and that orchestration layer is something I'm really looking forward to because sometimes you'll yeah. have a scenario where the big monster creates complex fields, but then your fast little agile data flows, they grab the source object and you just edge mark on those little extra bits. So you want to make sure that guy that's only running nightly finishes uh, before you start trying to feed it into downstream sources. Otherwise, you're, you're just asking for drift. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what is happening because there's no way I can run a hundred million row every hour. It's exciting, yeah. No. Still a lot of work to do with um, templates, for example, um, starting to adopt data prep more. You know, they often lead into data flows right now. So, yeah, more work to do. So what happens, Tim, um, and like I said, it's been since the last release since I looked like exactly how it works and I haven't uh, I'm bad. I have not had a beta org for fun. Um, if you build one of these and then you need to go back into the second or third node and restructure it, I remember in the last one, in the last, when I was building them, it, I had to kind of start all over. Um, so what happens if you build it out 25 nodes and you need to go to you know node four and uh, put something in and then re uh, structure it and oh, i change the source yeah or change the source or 
uh, you know, you need an, another augment in the beginning, <laughs> you know, the typical things that happen to us, right? But we get asked, you know, I need you also to put territories in there, you know, always happens to me after I'm done. So. Yeah, I think so. What's supported is adding new fields in, removing fields from an existing input. Um, you can add in a new data source and and then link that through a join or an append into an existing part mm -hmm. of the graph. Um, if you if you dramatically change the schema of an input node, you're going to have to face some cleanup. But we do automatically propagate everything downstream. Um, but on, then, you know. You Cases though, I remember seeing you will be able to save and copy and, and do different things with pieces of your of what you built, right? Like the UI will, it'll get there. <laughs> right. Okay. I just yeah, wanted yeah. to release had like the ability to go back in and make changes because like we're never making changes, right? To our giant tables. <laughs> Speaking of going back, you know, we're working on an undo redo button for the, for the summer release and mm -hmm. a version history capability as well. So version history will arrive on an API la layer in the spring release. Um, and then for the summer release, we're adding the UI for oh, cool. going back a version of your recipe. Four years later, after we got the first UI. Yeah. <laughs> for data flight into it, yeah. Well, yeah. That, UI was a, that UI was a holdover. It was a way to buy time for, <laughs> for data prep. The game changer. What are you talking about? Well, it was also get us out of JSON because it was for so many yeah. people, just completely unapproachable. But it's like it's not that they, it's not that they can't build the stuff. They can't build the stuff in a text editor, especially when they or don't have a giant pile of you're samples. You're a visual person. You have to see it to be able to go back and learn how to code it. Oh, the so. first time that that I saw the data that I was building in that UI, and I dragged all the nodes around. <laughs> and it was, it was like, it was like finally getting to see the sculpture <laughs> with the blindfold taken off the sculpture I had made and it looked like how I expected expected it to. Then I couldn't figure out where the save button was and I reopened it and I thought, oh, wait, I was like, <laughs> clearly I'm doing this wrong. Clearly the, the nodes will persist. I just don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Oh, we have it now. We have it now. Please and there's, there's Matt's plug-in. Pete, we should have a coffee hour with all the crazy things that you have done. Yeah, or uh, yeah, data. That would data be like a week. Error. That's like a, a, retreat, a retweet treat with Pete, right? We like. I want to. I, I want to do it sooner than then, but I think like a good Halloween episode would be, you know, data tribe horror stories. Don't make Halloween games <laughs> sooner than where we are right now. Um, no, let's all come back to this. Like, I want to see after this release. I want to bring Tim back, and we can show what we've built against. Like, I mean, we and we won't hold you to anything, but just be like, this is. What yeah, we're no, that would be great. Kind of the. the I'm sure, I have um, more um, more exciting updates. In, awesome. In just a release. So. Thank you. Thanks so for much. thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. We're now we're all a little stir crazy from pandemic. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, some days for Jen and but me, was, what keeps us going. Yeah, yeah. Our industry peers in the state of tribe, like, this is what we have, right, on a lot of days. Plus a our lot work. of days, this is all we do. Day in, day out, this is what we're looking at. Yeah. Like. Oh, he knows. <laughs> he has to hear from I, us. I, I miss, yeah, no, but I, I miss hanging out with you all in, in person. Yes, um, we do. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this year. Yep. Well, all right. But this year or not, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Someday when places are yeah, together again. Yeah, and you get to meet all the all new right, people. Ladies, thanks for so having me. I need positive, to help. But all you right. thank you so so much. Thank we you. Really, really, really My pleasure. Mm -hmm.